the spirit of the law. This is our, I want to say, fourth year. And um, really, this series emerged um, from an idea that I had when I started law school and that um, I discussed with USC students. Um, to create a space where we can talk about the big questions in terms of your legal profession, the questions that, and co conversations you might already be having outside the classroom, but to create a sort of forum and a kindred community of law students to really explore these questions in our life. These are the questions of how do I find meaning and purpose in my life as an attorney? How do I use my degree in creative and innovative ways? How do I connect the personal and the professional in my life? When I went to law school, I was told either you can teach or you can practice. But when I left law school, I saw people doing all sorts of unique things with their degrees. I think it's the most versatile graduate degree you can get. And my feeling was that if we heard these stories and people told us about their journeys and we were able to engage with them in some capacity, then we could think differently about our own careers. And um, we're really grateful that we're in our fourth year. It's uh, been a great series so far. I think we, serving a free lunch also helps. Um, so we really uh, hope to see you at all of our events this year. And at every event, we have someone who's in a different domain of law, a professor, perhaps a human rights attorney, perhaps a corporate attorney, or someone else uh, who's done something completely different, like a musician or a filmmaker who has a law degree. So we really try to keep each um, uh, session um, unique in and of itself. We generally do about three uh, of these a semester, so six over the course of the year. I'm very grateful to Jennifer, who's our student leader, for putting uh, this all together. Let's give her a, a round of applause. And also, if you'd like to get involved, you can ask her. We're always looking for student leaders to help drive um, the series. And there's a sign-up sheet here that we'll pass around. Please put your name on and email address on it, and we'll make sure we keep you updated on all of our uh, series um, uh, in the future. How many 1Ls are here today? Oh, great. And how many folks interested in entertainment law? All right, well, maybe after today, <laughs> that'll change. <laughs> Generally, what we do is uh, the speaker speaks for about 20 minutes, and then we open it up for questions and answers. We'll try and wrap up today around 110 or 115 just to get uh, the room clear for the next group of students. Uh, and now it's my great honor to introduce to you today's special speaker, Jesse Siskel. Jesse is only 10 years out of law school, not that old, uh, but he's already founded his own entertainment law company in Beverly Hills. His uh, practice area focused on corporate transactional work, uh, as well as a lot of entertainment work, especially with movie studios and um, music publishing houses. I met Jesse because we're working on this immense graphic novel slash sci-fi project called Anomaly, which was coming out in November. It'll really be a game changer uh, in terms of uh, how people think about graphic novels and new media. And so uh, I really enjoyed meeting him through that project. Jesse went to the UC San Diego as an undergraduate. He graduated from uh, UC Hastings Law School. And um, before he started his own law firm, he worked for several global law firms, which he'll tell us about, uh, and sort of found his way. He also does a lot of nonprofit work, particularly around helping um, young people who are st struggling with substance abuse. And he's a new father, so I'm not sure how he does it all. Like, I want to know how he does it all because I find he's achieved a remarkable balance in his life, especially for an attorney in Los Angeles. So I'm very grateful that he was, uh, is able to clear some time for us today. I know how busy he is. Um, and please join me in welcoming to Spirit of the Law, Jesse Sisko. Thank you. Just for those that don't know, graphic novels are not pornographic novels. People are born with that. It's, it's a glorified comic book. And Broom can very helpfully help establish our religion that floats throughout uh, the religion of one. Um, I'd like to say that being back in this classroom brings happiness. It does not. Um, but anyway, so I'll give you a quick snapshot of, kind of how I grew up, and which may or may not have affected where I am now, which is to give you a little background. Um, I grew up in Marin County, which is just north of the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, late 70s, complete hippie household. Um, I teethed on a mango seed, if that gives you <laughs> any indication of, of where my parents were at. Um, and early on, I found my parents used to kind of tease because I was very interested in business and all these entrepreneurial little projects I'd do as a kid. And the, the, you may be too young for this reference, there's a show called Family Ties. They used to call me Alex P. Keaton. Um, but anyway, so I was always involved in business. Um, thought I'd do something in business. As I got into college, uh, I was an econ major. I liked it. It 
very little reading. It was pretty pretty easy to, to get by. Um, I wasn't super focused like a lot of other students. I had pre-med students that knew exactly what they wanted to do. They wanted to go to med school or you know, so-and-so was definitely going to work in the entertainment industry, whatever it took. They worked in the mailroom and all that stuff. Um, I just knew vaguely I wanted to do deals. I had interest in sports. I had interest in entertainment. I had interest in politics. And I started just kind of looking at different options. So I interviewed for jobs. I looked at grad school programs. And I realized a lot of the sectors I were interested in, I was interested in, um, a law school education was kind of presented as a great foundation. And for someone like me who, until I got to law school, I kind of cruised. And, and um, this was a way to kind of skip those mailroom assistant jobs and kind of go right into maybe an executive job. So that was the thought process. And when I mentioned it to peers, I'm like, oh, of course. You know, law school makes sense for you. And I don't know quite what that meant, but I think maybe they just thought I was, you know, good at talking or something. Um, so I applied to law school. I took a year off. I traveled around. I took the LSATs. I went to law school uh, with the intention of not practicing law as a lawyer, but I would go into one of these industries and I'd focus and learn more about the background on politics, more about the sports industry, more about the entertainment industry. Signed up for the different clubs. Um, Somewhere along the line, I think it was late in my first year, I got completely sucked into the law school track, which meant, um, I don't know if you guys have, when does OCI or the on campus interviewing happen here? That was August. August. For one, oh, for two L's. Right. And one L's is, is it early January? February? Anyway. Um, I don't know if it was the competitive side of me or what it was, or I was putting myself through school also. All of a sudden I got completely captured with the idea of like going to you know the biggest best law firm I could go to. And um, before I knew it, I, I, I went to one of these big global law firms, great salary, um, and was doing litigation. So it was, it was completely off my plan, but um, enjoying it, also enjoying a little of the prestige. I mean, I never flown first class or done all this stuff, and so there was some fun with that. Um, but about four or five years, I started to completely question what I was doing. I mean, I was working like crazy. Um, I saw most of the partners I was working for, they were all, for the most part, pretty unhappy. There were some that I think found a way to make it work. Um, but I'll just I'll tell you really quickly what I thought some of the, the pluses and minuses for those that are considering the big firm route. Um, if you have no idea what you want to do, it's a great route because uh, it's much easier to start at a big firm and then go small or go industry or whatever you want to do um, than the other way around. Um, you're going to get excellent training. You're going to have big clients with very big budgets that will allow you to you know, study and research the way you do in law school, take things to the detail that you just can't do for smaller budgets, smaller clients. Um, and I think getting, especially for me, getting that kind of discipline and detail orientation very early um, w was helpful. Um, but I think if you are showing talent and showing success in the big firm, you need to be careful <laughs> because, uh, you know, the big firm model works primarily on leveraging billable hours. So it's up to you to draw that line and maintain some balance. They won't want to lose you if, they're, if, if you're really good, but the more hours they can get out of you, the better. And that's just the way the model works. So, so, um, I also went to a big firm, I went to a firm that had been around since the 1800s, and I thought that this was a very safe route to start. And I watched that firm completely dissolve and fall apart. It's a firm of 600 lawyers. Uh, right around the time Lehman fell apart, it was during the economic crisis. Um, and so I had a couple lessons from that, which I think shaped to my next few steps, which got me to ultimately building my own firm. But, um, this was a firm that, it was called Heller Ehrman, so you guys may not even know the name by now because it went under in 2008. But, uh, you know, it helped finance the Golden Gate Bridge. It's like, it's one of these old established firms, San Francisco based. And we decided to expand in London and New York, kind of at the wrong time. And a whole bunch of different things happened that's not worth going into, but ultimately they had to, they had to make a decision to pull the plug. And this was very enlightening. For me, because I saw all these guys I respected, guys who, guys and gals who had been um, 
practicing for 30, 40 years, uh, and most of them have absolutely nowhere to go. The, the young up-and-comers had plenty of options. They were, they were going to other big firms. But, and, and I guess this, this is one of my takeaways. No matter how much of a talented lawyer you are, no matter how connected you are with different people in the firm, only those that actually had business had independence. So that they were allowed to structure new deals and go wherever they wanted. The others were, it was sort of like a sticky chip. They were just hoping that someone uh, gave them a chance to go with them. And it was very sad for me to see people who had dedicated 30 or 40 years to this one firm and literally their retirement was gone and they were just hoping that someone would take them along. And I knew at that point I really didn't want to be in that, in that spot. So um, I sat down with some of the, the so-called rainmakers and, and got some more insight. And everyone told me the same lesson, which I'll instill in you, is the only way that you really will have um, true independence, I don't mean just as someone with a law degree, I mean as a practicing lawyer, is I think there's two, there's two ways. One is, and it's uncomfortable at times, but you take the steps to actually build your own business, even if it's very small clients, even if it's cl you know, clients that you don't particularly enjoy working with. But you take that step to actually build your own business, and it's yours, and you have independence that way. The, the other way, um, and some of your professors may have told you this, is to become an absolute specialist in the subject matter, and then and you become um, much more valuable, um, less fungible. That, that, the latter idea for me was tough, because Similar to how I was coming out of college, I wasn't super focused in a particular practice. I wasn't like, oh my god, I'm definitely going to be a tax specialist, or I just want to work on patents. I still didn't have that. I still kind of had this general vague, well, I like being an advisor for people. I like doing deals. I think I connect with people. I have a certain knack for getting deals done. Uh, but I wasn't super focused, so I ultimately had to go, or chose to go, the route of building my own business. And the way I did that, when Hell Herman was going under, um, I interviewed at some other big firms. I saw they all kind of looked pretty much the same as what I had left. And uh, I joined a group of, there's a firm called Skadden Arps, so I, I joined a group of folks who were leaving Skadden Arps because they were a little burnt out. They still wanted to do high level work, but they kind of wanted to do it in a way that, that worked for their lifestyles. And so um, I helped them put together their firm and it allowed me to bring in at big firms, by the way, unless you have unbelievable connections, it's very hard to bring in a client because the threshold is so high. You know, I mean, usually you have to start with a hundred thousand dollar retainer. I didn't have any friends or family that were in a position to do that. So, um, it allowed me to kind of get on my feet, and I was fortunate enough to do a good job for the right people. And word of mouth spread, and um, ended up getting some really big clients in the film business. Um, but also in you know technology and general corporate finance and um, a lot of different what would fall into the category of general corporate transactional work um, and it's kind of just been going and going to the point where I realized I should just open up my own shop and start hiring people and um, have that much more control as to where this thing is going. Um, and so that's kind of where I where I am today, just on the <coughs> business track, uh, but. Varun mentioned how I kind of keep balance, and so I, I think I've kind of always had this built-in rationale, and um, you know, it works for me, it doesn't work for others necessarily, but um, I hated missing things. I just hated being stuck in my office late at night and feeling like I was kind of missing out on all the sweet stuff of life, and so I started to um, rationalize that if I just left early and did the stuff that was fun, then I'd be that much more recharged to then come back and be more efficient the next day. And um, I've sort of stuck with that. So I'll leave in the middle of the day and play tennis or you know, do what I feel like I have to do um, so I still feel charged up. And usually I get the same amount of stuff done. And it just, it just kind of works out that way. Um, part of the pro bono aspect really started in when I was at the big firm. So that's another great thing about big firms. It's much easier to take on big, really important pro bono matters um, because you're getting paid the same salary regardless. And so as long as your firm okays it, uh, it gives you some great experience and it gets, gets you um, on the ground helping people. And so um, I got very involved in the ACLU and I helped kind of uh, spearhead their foundation advisory board. Um, I ended up 
forming and starting, or uh, serving on the board of a, an organization called Angels at Risk, which offers free substance abuse counseling uh, for teens throughout, uh, really throughout LA, but mainly West LA. Um, and same with a music academy called SOLA. Um, and then I'm on an advisory board for Conservation International. And at this point, I can't take on really substantive matters. I just can't afford to do it, so I'm a little stretched. Um, but I still love, I go to the board meetings and I stay engaged and um, I think especially what I do, I'm around a lot of people that are making way too much money and for me to get back to what's really going on and what most people are going with is very grounding um, as a way I can still contribute. Um, I, this was originally framed as sort of, uh, you know, law and spirituality and so I was I didn't know if I could really speak on the philosophy and the spirit as to what I've done, but I know one thing uh, that came up when I was thinking about this was um, how my ego definitely affected my decision making. And I think it's something that um, I'll just advise you to be mindful of, because I, I think initially I got a little off track and went to the biggest, baddest firm I could not necessarily because it was what I wanted to do long term, I just, it kind of like felt good to feel like I got the big job and um, it, it, it gave me a good story that I could tell, like, oh, I'm working at so-and-so, working for these big important clients. And uh, I probably paid a little too much attention to what I thought others would think about where I was going. Um, and even this last decision of, I had all this great business, all these great, like, you know, you'd know the names, clients. Um, and I still felt hesitant to go and open my own thing because at the big firm, we always looked down on folks that did that. And so uh, that still provided a little more hesitation than it should have. Finally, I was like, who cares? Like, I'm making, you know, plenty of money and um, I'm able to get home in time to, you know, see my eight month old go to bed. And um, it's way more fun this way and I can do it how I want to do it. So, but, but it took me a while to finally, I mean, in retrospect, maybe it doesn't seem like that long, but it was, it was one of my biggest hurdles, actually, outside of anything going on with the economy or anything. It was worrying about what my story would sound like to other people. So, um, just pay attention to that if you can. It's, that's one bit of, I guess, so-called spiritual advice, I would say. But, um, I don't know if I've talked for five or 20 minutes. How, how long has it been? I don't really pay about 20. About 20? Yeah. So, um, let's see if there's anything else I wanted to really touch on here. Um, that, that was sort of my initial notes about what I wanted to share. Um, um, if anyone has any questions, I can go into detail about what I do or, you know, how I got business or um, the work, life, family balance, anything. Feel free. Yes? So, would you change anything? Um, hmm. Going to the big firm and, and going that route and it sort of sounds like you sort of generated clients sort of out of those relationships and now have ended up where you are. I mean, I think that's, that's kind of the ultimate question. I, I feel like there's a big part of it supposed to say I would not change anything because it got me exactly to where I am. Um, I would not change going to the big firm. Um, because I do think, for me at least, I needed to have a little more of a work ethic and a little more discipline than I had. I wasn't one of those people. You know, I was a public school kid. I never had like that grind of, you know, three to four hours of homework every night. I just didn't have that. I kind of cruised. So for me, that was really good. It got me really detailed focused. Um, it got me, you know, I had never worked on stuff at that level. I mean, working like multi-billion dollar stuff. Um, so I think I stayed a little too long, you know? I knew at one point, probably about four years in, that this is not, even if, and, I, and there's, you know, I was, thought I was doing what I needed to do to stay on partnership with Crack. Um, but even if I made partner, I realized it's not what I wanted to do. But it was just so easy to stay. I had a nice salary and all this stuff. And so I probably lost a couple of years where I could have been out there doing, you know, being a little happier doing what I was doing. Uh, I don't regret going, but I think I got a little lazy installed there for a little while. Yeah, no, 
that's a great question. There definitely <laughs> there are other stresses, but I don't mind them nearly as much. Um, it also depends on your personality. I know um, some really great lawyers, and they just don't want to deal with all that. You know, they want to come in, they want to have their project essentially signed, and then they want to leave at the end of the day and not worry about it. And I totally respect that. Um, for me, that never, I, I wanted to have more control of it, and um, I didn't like, you know, the day before a holiday, someone just being, you know, I wanted to kind of know where things were going. Um, so there are definitely other annoyances. I mean, it's actually hard managing employees and doing that sort of thing. Um, also, little stuff that you don't think about, the billing, you know, admin, um, accounting, all those things. But it's, it's not, it doesn't bother me that much because I know ultimately I'd rather be dealing with some of that tedious stuff than some of the things I, I saw people go through at, at other firms. Any other questions? Um, actually, I throw out two of them. Um, one is um, we hear a lot about corporate lawyers struggling with the workload uh, at big firms, um, especially young lawyers who have billable hours to make and are also learning at the same time. What is the mood of young lawyers yeah. like at corporate law firms? And that's the first question. The second yeah. question is you've also you've done transactional and litigation. Right. Um, what? What are the pros and cons from your perspective, and why it seems to me that you've gravitated towards transactional? Mm -hmm. Why? Um, so, let's see, I, I gotta be careful, because it's very easy to say that the mood is cynical no. um, with associates at big firms, and that's not necessarily true. I mean, there are a lot of people that really kind of, they enjoy even, even the, the really hard working times, they just enjoy it, they, they kind of get a rush from it. Um, but I do think that there is a fundamental problem when the revenue model is strictly built on billable hours. Um, and especially with the salary wars, this would predate you guys, but um, there was no big law firm wanted to pay a little less than another big law firm. And so for a while, when things were going really well, early 2000s, late 90s, everyone started to lockstep. So once they raised salaries quite a bit, um, they needed to make sure that they got those hours. And the fallout from that is literally, I mean, I think, um, I mean, it was, I, I was at a big firm, I never billed less than 2,000 hours, which, I mean, that's 40 hours a week, but that, that doesn't sound like a lot, but that's actually billing on a client matter. And you're there doing all sorts of admin stuff and whatever else you do. Uh, and there are plenty of people I know with really big firms that to stay on partnership track were billing 3,000 hours. That's basically, you, that's all you're doing is being at the office. You're having every dinner there, every night, usually six nights a week. Um, and I don't, there's not many people that are going to be that happy, you know, when they're being worked that hard. That's why I said if you're really talented and they pick up on that, you need to also develop relationships with those partners and let them know that if this is a long-term fit for you, there needs to be some give and take because there's a tendency that they're already paying you a set amount, so the more hours they get, that's more profit for the partners. So, you got to kind of be careful balancing that. Generally speaking, I think a lot of big firm associates, once they get past year, call it four or five, um, they start really seriously evaluating where their career is going. And except for the very few, um, a lot of them start to get pretty turned off uh, on what the path looks like for them. But they also realize that they have this great launch pad now. Four years of a really big firm, you have all sorts of opportunities that you can go work with. If you're in entertainment, you can get a great job in a studio, you can um, I mean, you can do all sorts of things. You can leave the law, and it's a great foundation. So they're often thankful for what they've had, but not that excited about what lays in front of them if they stay. Um, litigation versus transactional is just completely based on personality. Um, I started out as sort of a corporate and IP litigator. Um, and my main client, we were working on Microsoft Matters. and. Uh, the part I liked about it, and by the way, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I felt like law school kind of gears you towards litigation. I mean, you have like, um, you're mainly reading cases, you know, there's um, moot court and all the stuff that I felt like was more the natural gearing of law school was towards litigation. Um, and I actually took cor corporate finance and tax and all these classes because I was thinking about transactional, but. Um, 
there's a lot more strategy, I think, early on, depending on the firm you're with and the group you're working with, that can be really exciting. I mean, because there is this feeling of like, okay, we're pitted up against them, and we're gonna try to outsmart that, because we're smarter than they are. That's kind of the mentality a lot of the time, and um, at least in the corporate litigation setting. Um, that part actually is pretty fun. I mean, that, that's you're getting paid for your mind, you know, your decision making, your judgment, and that's the part I really enjoy. The rub on it for me, especially in the very big, big, you know, big litigation, multi-billion dollar litigation, is the process from that little, you know, brainstorming session we have to the two years that follows can sometimes be a lot of very, very boring process, including what you've heard of as document review, where you know you just click, click, no, no, yes, yes, as you go through all the different documents that may or may not be uh, relevant or responsive. Um, and I just, I wanted things to move a little quicker. That was part of my issue with it. Um, I also really enjoyed mediation and getting to the resolution part. I realized that was actually my favorite part. So I thought, well then I'm not gonna be the best litigator because I'm just trying to get this resolved. You know, I have to love the fight, I think, to really. Um, and there's a lot of strategy with transactional work too, but I like that usually both sides are working to get to a place that they both want to get to. You know, litigation, one side does not want to be there usually. Sometimes both sides. Um, so for me, I like that. Like if we, if we strike a great deal here, everyone's happy, maybe everyone makes a lot of money, it's a positive end result. And that just fit for, I guess, who, who I am, my personality a little more. Yes? You mentioned briefly kind of getting paid for your mind and this whole, people are smarter than the other side. Do you, did that ever, did that same attitude ever turn you off in any way? That it was all of these people, being these people talking about ego, <coughs> yeah. just who were convinced they were the best and that yeah. it was just acceptable to You know, in retrospect, it, it Turned, it kind of <laughs> turns me off thinking about it. You, I have to admit, I kind of got swept up in it a little bit. Um, it's part of the kind of like the big firm dance. It was like, especially when we had a smaller firm that we hadn't heard of. Sometimes those smaller firms are, you know, they will really kick your butt because those guys are as smart, if not smarter, they've made a choice to kind of be quicker and more efficient. So I'm here. But there is an attitude that, you know, we're a big deal firm, we, you know, we get hired for big deal stuff, and that's because we know more than everyone else. And when I got swept up into it, I was like, wow, yeah, oh, silly then, you know, we're gonna outsmart them this way. I did get a little swept up. I actually kind of enjoyed it a little bit. Looking back on it, it's a little distasteful um, and a little disrespectful, yeah. But it goes on. Can you tell us a little bit more about, like, your involvement with SOLA and the other nonprofit sure. and how it impacts you? Sorry? Yeah. Um, I, you know, it probably doesn't impact my pr professional career as much as it impacts kind of my personal life, you know. And I guess it impacts my professional career because it makes me feel a little bit better about like, holistically everything that I'm doing with, you know, the education I have. Um, SOLA is actually really cool. It's a small grassroots organization that's trying to adapt to economic times by offering um, free or discounted um, music classes for kids. So for a lot of public schools that have had to cut back on those programs, um, they, off they offer individual classes to um, tutoring. And it's the whole um, UCLA graduate school, music graduate school staff that is teaching. So, pretty simple idea, but, um, you know, we get instruments donated, and, you know, we have, like, every, every other month we meet, and we discuss strategy, and we discuss how we can, you know, impact more kids, raise more money, do all that stuff. A lot of those meetings, it's not even really um, any legal background I bring in. It's just, and this is, I think, kind of one of the cool things about um, the law school thought process versus the actual substance that you learn. Um, you, people just really respect what you have to say. Uh, so often it's just a common sense approach that I bring, you know. Um, or I've seen organizations function and fall apart or thrive, and so I kind of have that in the background, but it's not any specific piece of um, legal advice. It's just kind of the common sense you bring, your wisdom you bring, because you've had to go through this long process of education. And that's almost all my uh, nonprofit work. Angels at Risk is like that. I'm on a board, uh, 
I'm on the board, and you know, if a legal issue comes up, I, I comment on it, or I make sure that they follow what they have to to maintain their 501c3 status. But normally, I just get called because they have a decision to make about the organization. And that's the part that's kind of fun about being a lawyer. When people call on you, just they just they just want your counseling. You know, they respect your gut sense of what you think is right or wrong. They're willing to pay for and they really respect it. That's the part I like. So, anything else? Are we almost there? They're the breadwinners for their family, and you know, so they've they've had a, a little one, and then they've stayed on, and some of them have done um, like either an eighty percent program where they get one day off, or a sixty percent program, and sometimes that works. Sometimes they end up working the same amount of hours. They're just home, you know, um, and getting paid less sometimes. So it doesn't work that way. Um, it really depends on the group you're working with. I have to say. It's not even so much the firm. Um, there, there are certain senior people that realize how important that is, and they really respect this person, they want to keep them, and so they'll draw boundaries. I think firms in general are not very good about that. So um, when making decisions, if, if any of you are thinking about going to a big firm, um, and it's hard to really tell in the OCI process, but certainly if you're doing the summer program, really try to get a sense of um, the senior people and whether you think that you could connect with them such that if you got into a family situation they would be understanding of it because I found when I was at Heller uh, certain people are just really great about it uh, and they themselves live that way like I worked for a partner who worked for two months out of the year um, at his vacation home and he stayed connected but he was like you know out of the decision he made and everyone was fine with it and therefore he was much more respectful when you took vacations and did things so you see a lot of partners that you can just tell they rarely leave the office and they're not going to be as, as kind on those issues. That's what I found. By the way, going to a small firm doesn't necessarily solve that issue. You know, plenty, plenty, plenty of lawyers and small firms work around the clock. <coughs> One last okay. question, Amanda. Um, what advice do you give to young to law students who are envisioning a career in entertainment law? Where are the growth areas? What's exciting? What would you say to them? Mm -hmm. um, well, growth areas, certainly um, financing. I mean, having a really good corporate background is much more key now because the money doesn't flow the way it used to. In other words, studios have to co-finance most of their work now to diversify their risk. So you have all sorts of, you know, people from, I mean, tons of money come from China, tons of money come from India, there's all sorts of cross-border transactions, way more complicated that way. Um, but there's a lot of need for young, talented lawyers to help craft these deals. These deals have never been done before um, on figuring out new ways to finance creative content. It used to be pretty simple. You just do, we, do you like my project, Studio A? Oh, you do? Okay, great, it's being made and all the contracts are pretty formed. Now it's not like that. I mean, there, it's, it's much more complicated. And my, my initial involvement was because I had this corporate background. So just a very quick example is um, there's a pretty big name producer named Bob Simons. Um, you probably won't know his name, but he does like all Adam Sandler's movies. And his traditional talent lawyer uh, has always done those deals. It's pretty easy. You just negotiate the points he's getting. Um, this time, he was talking with a very big private equity company. And the private equity company was interested in essentially playing studio. So, because this private equity company now owns a big piece of CAA. So, they said, well, we're going to do this very complicated structure. We're going to hire Scott and Arps. And uh, you're going to bring all your cool material to us. We're going to decide if it's cool enough, and then we'll finance it, and then we'll work together to co-finance the studio. 
That now, that's something that a traditional talent lawyer, entertainment lawyer would totally not know how to handle. Um, so coming in with new creative uh, kind of finance and corporate background will allow you to jump in and create new ways of, of making these, uh, these deals function. The other thing is I think you have to be really willing to work um, with some really out there people, um, which is, uh, is part of the reason I do okay with things. I, I think my background is exposed to lots of different people. Um, it's just the entertainment business is very strange. Breeds a lot of very strange people. They're really sweet people, but really bizarre and at times like ridiculous people. And you have to not take that too seriously. Uh, I think if you took it too seriously, you'd be out in a couple of weeks because I mean, there's just some really ludicrous stuff that goes on. And um, I'm not even going to give examples on that actually. <laughs> but uh, and, and a lot of the talent lawyers out there, I think. Some of them are just unbelievably talented and very cool down there with people. Some of them, I think, secretly wish they were the celebrities. And so they start kind of acting like that, too. And um, you just need to kind of you know, laugh that off and get the deal done. Uh, anyway, I think we're pretty much there. Anyone have any final questions, comments? Can you say I'm sorry, just read actors in? <laughs> you know what? I, it is because I don't even like watching it. It kind of is like too close. Um, so yeah, it is. Sadly, <laughs> it's exactly right. Yeah. Well, please join me in thanking Jesse.